All right. Greetings, friends. My name is Wes Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Monday, May 8th at Asia Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. We are back from Golden Week holiday with Asia markets and market participants in Japan and China uh, reopened and reactivated for um, or after being absent from the global picture last week. Um, and we have a lot to cover today. Uh, so we are looking at the week ahead uh, out of Asia. We're looking at China trade balance data coming. The G7 finance ministers meeting in Japan with an agenda that includes financial stability and banking crises. Um, we also have China lending data to end the week. And this is also alongside, of course, US CPI and the Bank of England as key themes this week in the ex-Asia macro world. Now, before we get into uh, you know, the very notable price action today in Chinese bank stocks, let me just mention the Berkshire Hathaway event over the weekend. And with regards to the recent trip to Tokyo that spurred this you know, renewed interest in Japanese equities as a whole, not just in the five Japan trading houses that Berkshire is invested in. Buffett said that he wanted to basically, the reason for his visit, he wanted to introduce uh, Abel his, to his executives or to the executives um, from the five trading houses, recognizing that there will be continued investments and relationships there. Uh, quote, the Japanese thing was simple. Buffett said, I like looking at companies. I like looking at figures about companies. That's his explanation for coming to Japan. He likes looking at companies. He likes looking at figures at, about companies. That's his commentary. Now, again, it's not so much what Buffett is saying as much as uh, what he's being asked about, which is, once again, why the trip to Tokyo? That qu question still seems to remain, remain and remain sufficiently unanswered. Um, and as Takakato, the former head of trading at Bitflyer, who I interviewed um, for the first market depth interview of this podcast, uh, had said on the last episode on Friday, um, you know, we may never know what Warren Buffett's true reasons for behind, you know behind this very short trip to Tokyo was. Um, and uh, by the way, if you haven't seen that interview um, with Takakato and myself, please check it out. It's fantastic insight from Taka. He is a veteran macro guru and we talk about all things Japan. Bank of Japan, Japan equities, this you know the J Japan investors, how they break down uh foreign investors into Japan and and so much more. Okay. So, what happened in Asian markets of note today? We have a massive breakout rally in Chinese bank stocks, okay? And they've added 166 billion in market cap on mostly state-backed banks to the CSI 300 financials index. And among them are the Bank of China and China Citic Bank, both of which hit limit up 10% intraday today. This is the first time since July 2015 in which they did so. And we're going to get back to that July 2015 in a minute. Very, very key and important uh, time. But first, so why is this happening? Why are bank shares in China rallying? So the fundamental reasons largely, you know, twofold i suppose okay first of all you have the most recent q1 earnings of chinese bank stocks that have been terrible from a margins uh, perspective um and this is because chinese officials have been pressuring banks to you know extend cheap loans to small medium sized enterprises and businesses um as well as the households uh after battering you know easy lending to the property market in the past 2 years you know after doing that they've now about faced and now they're they're pushing banks to extend cheap loans to small, medium-sized SMEs and to, to households. And so basically, banks with their lending pressure, uh, margin now under pressure, there's been a recent trend in the last month or so in which smaller Chinese banks, they've been lowering their deposit rates in order to preserve their net interest margins. And then now, we just saw that the, the majors follow suit in also lowering their deposit rates as well. Okay, so there's that immediate trigger catalyst for bank shares in China to rally. The second thing is if you combine this catalyst, uh, catalyst against a backdrop of broader ongoing positive sentiment for SOEs for state-owned enterprises, um, you know, that's been picking up over the last few months, right? There's basically been various um, SOE reforms, new re new measures and guidelines for uh, SOE bond issuance that's been implemented. Um, for which you know the the debt issuance process has been made uh, more efficient, but as well as um, it's been made to to be able to withstand against um, or be become stronger against defaults and credit risk. Um, 
So that sentiment has also been cre- kind of creeping in. So, you know, those two sort of catalysts, one immediate, one sort of, you know, happening over the last few months, um, in combination with just very low valuations on Chinese banks trading at 0.6x book value versus the 0.8 times book value for the broader Asia bank indexes, according to Bloomberg. Um, and you combine all that and you get huge upside momentum in these in these massive, massive Chinese bank shares. Now, I want to point out a few things. First, despite the massive share and price rallying going on, let's just keep in mind that fundamentally, the big picture isn't exactly rosy for China banks either, right? Because there's still very much the major question of how their books look or say exposure to bad loans in the property sector. Um, and then there's also the uncertainty around the slowdown of the broader Jap- uh, the broader Chinese economic picture as well. So, you know, to go limit up 10%, assuming a lot of that's got to be short covering, um, but it's also just to keep in mind, like, and there might be new longs thrown in there, but it's also important to keep in mind what the context of the economic backdrop actually is. Um, and on that note, you know, if we look at the China debt picture, we also got the most recent data from the PBOC of the macro leverage ratio, okay, which macro leverage ratio is basically it's the total debt amount to GDP as a percentage. And that came in at 280% of total debt to GDP for Q1, according to the PBOC and Bloomberg. Now, um, note that this China macro leverage ratio is, again, it's total debt to GDP. Okay, It's not just government debt to GDP, for which Japan takes the cake. But if you look at it from total debt to GDP, that measures government debt. And then in addition, it also includes household debt, corporate debt, and so on. So 208% total debt to GDP in China is a 7.7% increase on a quarter over quarter basis. And that would be the biggest increase in three years. And three years is significant because that would be around the time when the central government began its broad and brutal deleveraging campaign, for which it then most recently did an about face on. Um, and according to Bloomberg, and that seems to be reflected in the data. Okay, Now, according to Bloomberg, uh, at an April briefing, A PBOC spokesperson said that the macro leverage ratio actually hit as high as 290% at one point in Q1 of 2023, but that was due in part due to like seasonal factors. Now, if you look at the breakdown of this total debt to GDP in China, you'll see that the leverage ratio is the highest for the non-financial sector, okay? Or in other words, like the corporates. Um, And this does not include the LGFVs, the local government financing vehicles, right? So it's mostly the corporates, right? Um, The leverage ratio is the highest for them at 165% compared to that of the household leverage ratio, which uh, is at 63%, and government sector leverage ratio at 50%, okay? And also note that non-financial sector um, was the biggest increase among the others, just from just going under 160% last quarter to now over 165% for Q1. And then you've compared that to household and government sectors. Each of those rose less than 1% Q, uh, quarter over quarter. Okay. Now, this non-financial sector leverage, again, comprised of loans from, you know, uh, in the form of corporate bonds, um, trust loans, um, various ki- kinds of bank loans and, and, and overseas loans even, right? But this is the very sector that I had mentioned in as part of this SOE reform and, and bond issuance, um, which, again, is supposed to ha- have strengthened measures against credit and uh, default risk. Um, but once again, having bank shares rally and trade limit up, it's not because things are fantastic, but rather things got or are perceived to have gotten a bit less worse or less risky. There's a big difference there, and it's an important context to, to keep in mind. Um, it's effectively it's hitting the snooze alarm on button um, on a still very active time bomb. And lastly, um, going back to what I said earlier about you know the Bank of China and China Citic Bank shares hitting limit up ten percent intraday today this is the first time since July 2015, right? So let's revisit that July 2015 moment. Just as a reminder for those who may be unaware or may have forgotten. So in 2015, from January to July, 
Chinese equities were on an absolute tear upwards, very much including these bank stocks. Um, and Bank of China shares, they basically doubled in the first half of 2015. And then in the middle of the year, in July of 2015, um, Chinese equities, Chinese bank stocks, like Bank of China, you know, Bank of China stock shares started hitting like limit up, and which they haven't done since then until today, over a half decade ago. But immediately after they started hitting these like limit up levels um, on these bank stocks, the rally had sharply reversed. Chinese equities started plunging due to leveraged longs getting massive margin calls and forced liquidations and a lot of government intervention into markets and, and a bu- whole bunch of factors. But again, you know, just using Bank of China shares as a proxy of fun- the, the financial stocks, right? BOC shares fell about 40% from peak of July 2015 to just the end of the month of July 2015. It's like 35-40% um, plunge in, in share prices. And then after that, on August 11th, 2015, a day that will live in macro volatility infamy, the PBOC devalued the yuan against the US dollar, and that sent global markets on a true cross-asset class massive uh, explosion of volatility shockwaves. Like this was truly across all asset classes, FX, bonds, commodities, everything. Um, But just for a simple context, the S&P 500, which had been trading range bound and flat with a VIX below 15 for much of that year of 2015, SPX suddenly falls 10% within a a week. And VIX goes from about 13 to over 40 in just a few days. Now, I'm not saying that this is the same scenario today, nor am I even saying that this is currently applicable, let alone that this is what's going to happen on the heels of today's Chinese bank share stocks rallying. August and July uh, 2015 were completely different and unrelated scenarios and market setups and so on. Um, But these Chinese bank shares sharp rally and crash and then the subsequent PBOC shock yuan devel in August of 2015 that was from a market's perspective perspective one of the most significant global ma- you know market volatility explosions since the 08 crisis and it it actually it remains one of the most significant market event days um currently um you can list that you know up up alongside below but up alongside things like March 2020 and the like right it's up there on the list so I figured it's worth flagging that this is happening. This market activity is currently happening today. Because once again, you probably won't hear about this sort of market activity elsewhere unless you're being proactively made aware. And having this on your radar can't hurt. It can only help. Um, last point on China. Uh, Komatsu. Komatsu is, for those who don't know, it's Japan's caterpillar, if you will. Um, and it's therefore a gauge of global industrial activity. Komatsu just came out um, today and said that from their earnings perspective, from their corporate perspective, they don't see a China recovery in their forward outlook. Okay, so also something to note Um, and holds the same exact amount of water as if as if Caterpillar themselves were to say that they don't see a China recovery underway. However, you want to weight their views. All right. So that's it for me today. Keep your eyes out for China trade uh, trade balance data tomorrow on Tuesday, given the surprisingly strong exports from previous you know, last time we saw a 15% year over year uh, increase versus expectations of a 7% decline. Okay, so that was a huge, huge shock. That was the last reading. Tomorrow is going to be a new reading. Let's see what they come out with. We also have a very critical 10 year JGB auction tomorrow, Tuesday. Wednesday, we have US CPI. Thursday, G7 finance ministers and central banks governors meeting in Japan. Uh, Thursday, we also have the Bank of England. We're expecting a 25 basis point rate hike. We're going to be looking for Governor um, Bailey's forward guidance, if you will. And Thursday, we also have earnings, key earnings from JD.com, from Foxconn, from SoftBank, Nissan, and Honda. And then finally, keep your eyes on the Turkish lira, USD TROI, because we're going to head into Turkish elections on Sunday. And with implied volatility on the lira skyrocketing currently, as Erdogan is in the tightest race of his 20-year span, if the lira crumbles again, regardless of who wins the Turkish election, you may very well see market volatility turn into geopolitical volatility, which turns into further global market volatility uh, as a result. Okay, so that's it for me. 
See you all soon. Thanks for watching Market Depth on BlockWorks. And on behalf of BlockWorks, my name is Wes Nakamura. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Across the Spread. Make sure you have your notifications turned on for BlockWorks Macro and for Market Depth. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.